2 Samuel, and let's go ahead and go to 2 Samuel 5. We've been seeing at the end of 1 Samuel and into 2 Samuel, this is the period where David, God moves David um, amazingly to the throne. Because there are several obstacles in David's way, and God strategically goes through, and through nothing David does, removes those obstacles out of the way. Now what David does that is right is when he's offered the kingdom in the wrong ways, he does not accept it. He accepts it only when it's the right time when God has made him king. In 2 Samuel 2, David becomes king over Judah, okay, which is a region, it's not the whole kingdom, but Saul's remaining son, Ishbosheth, became king over uh, Israel, okay, the other region, not over the whole land. And there's a civil war. The, David and his men are successful in the Civil War. Even Saul's old general Abner joins David. Um, and then he might be a threat. And then he's assassinated by one of David's men because, he had, because Abner had killed uh, this guy's brother. And then, after this, uh, David is now made king. But Ishbosheth is still alive. Well, these two guys go and decide they're going to assassinate Ishbosheth in 2 Samuel 4. And it's so dramatic there what they do that it's kind of like, you know, in sports, like in football, um, I think is the primary one, but in, in soccer, in baseball, you have this now where since it's filmed, you can do an instant replay and it shows you, okay, we just saw that, but we need to look at it again. And that's what 2 Samuel 4 does. It tells you the event, and then it tells you the event again, because it's, it's emphasizing the seriousness there with pretty much an instant replay. And so Ishbosheth is dead. These guys go to Samuel, uh, go to David and say, We have killed Ishbosheth, assassinated him for you, and guess what he does to them? Kills them. He kills them, executes them, and he executes them by hanging impalement, he pins them to the wall. Um, and so they are. They die a God-cursed death. And so now David is set to become king. And remember, I talked about how Israel is generally disunited during this time, but now they will be united um, behind David. Look at 2 Samuel 5. It says, Then all the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone." And we are your flesh. Previously, when Saul was king over us, uh, you were the one uh, who led Israel out and in. And the Lord said to you, you will shepherd my people Israel, and you will be the ruler over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to uh, the king at Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them before the Lord at Hebron. Then they anointed David king over Israel. David was 30 years old when he became king and reigned 40 years. So now we finally have David the king. Uh, it even refers to him in this passage as King David. So now he's king over all of the land. The people recognize him. The people choose him. He's the man that God's chosen. They recognize that. All the obstacles are out of the way, and God has now brought David to the throne. And David is going to be a pivotal individual that God uses for what it means to be king, what the king's relationship is to God, and what that means for Israel and for the world as a whole. Now they come to David, and they say to him, you know, basically, you're our close relative, you're our brother, which uh, Deuteronomy 17 talks about when you choose a king, you must choose from among your countrymen, from your brothers. A foreigner cannot be king over you. And they also, but the way that they talk to David is they say to him, you are our bone, you are our flesh. It is close relationship, right? But where does that, what does that phrase sound like from earlier in the Bible? You are our bone, you are our flesh. What does that kind of sound like or maybe remind you of from way earlier in the Bible? Yeah, Macy? Um, Adam and Eve, when like, Eve was taken from Adam. Right. 
Adam, when God presents Eve as his wife, Adam's reaction is to call her bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. I believe that's Genesis 2.23. And so, this um, marriage relationship is a relationship of oneness, one flesh, union. That's what makes marriage marriage, is this relationship between man and woman in covenant before God. Now, the people come to David... And they say, you as king, you're our leader, ruler, shepherd, you're our bone, you're our flesh, we're related to you, we're one with you as your um, people. In other words, we're represented by you. Um, so where do you also see that language where they're referring to David? Uh, Israel refers to David in a way where David is the king, he's the representative before God, and before the nations, and Israel basically uses the language that says, David, the, the nation is like your body, the nation is like your bride. Okay? So they basically <clears throat> uh, refer to David and their relationship with him as king in this very close way, where the king, it's like the country is his, uh, is his wife or his own body. What does that sound like in the, the New Testament? Oh, um... Jesus is like the church? Jesus' relationship with the church, yeah. yeah. Paul picks up on this paradigm in Ephesians 5 and talks about what the nature of the church is, that the church is Christ's body and the church is Christ's bride because he's the king. Like David, he is the king and has this close relationship where, with his people. And then David is, is called a shepherd. God has chosen him to shepherd Israel. Um, he's taken from shepherding sheep to shepherd the people of God. Um, and he's also called a ruler. Now David is going to recognize that to do his job correctly, the way God wants him to, and to experience the blessings that he's meant to experience in, uh, in obeying God, David says, okay, I'm supposed to act as a shepherd, but ultimately I need to recognize that what? Psalm 23.1, most famous psalm, the Lord is... My shepherd. David says, okay, but God is my king. He's my leader. He's my shepherd. As long as David follows God and obeys God, it goes well. Blessing is produced on this heaven. When David does not obey God, and his sons and kings in his line do not obey God, do not follow God, then the curses and consequences start to uh, rule the day. And so David recognizes that he needs to be in good relationship with God and obedient to him. And when David does not, his kingdom starts to disintegrate. And we start seeing that in 2 Samuel 11. It doesn't start in 2 Samuel 11, but that's where we start seeing it. Um, and then David goes in 2 Samuel 5 and takes over this, uh, this region, this city called uh, Jabus. Okay. Now, Jabez is mentioned a couple of times under a couple of different names, and it is a city where in Judges, this is where the Judges version of Sodom and Gomorrah happened in Judges 19 in Jabez, which is a couple miles away from Bethlehem. Okay. Now, David takes over this city, and it becomes the capital. Okay. And what is that capital now? Um, of Israel. Uh, What's the capital city in Israel? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Yep, Jerusalem. This is where the kings will rule and be located. This is where all the kings will be born. David takes over, he renames it Jerusalem, which means city of peace. Um, Shalom is the word that's in there, which means peace, so used as a Hebrew uh, greeting. This is also where um, in Genesis 14, there's this king who is also a priest before God, before the Levitical system, who comes to Abraham after a war, and he's called uh, Melchizedek, and he is uh, said to be the king of Salem. This is probably early Jerusalem, way before the Jebusites and all this. Okay. Now he renames, he centralizes this city. This is where the kings are going to rule. This is where the kings are going to be from. Um, and so Jerusalem uh, becomes this 
key focal point. It also, he renames it Zion, which so sometimes you see these names, they're referring to the same, same thing, but with a different emphasis. Jerusalem has to do with more of um, this city in the plan of God in world history, like accomplishing things, uh, in, having an international impact in the world. Zion usually has to do with royal or messianic theology. Zion becomes like the central idea of God uh, reigning and ruling in the earth from this focal point. And he's going to do that through David's family and ultimately through the Messiah. Uh, Psalm 110 talks about, as he, God says that I've, uh, um, talks about sit at my right hand, says to the Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a uh, footstool for your feet. It then says there, Yahweh stretches forth from Zion and rules over the, the world through his king. Um, Psalm 2, written by David about the, the messianic king, also talks about God laughs at all the nations who resist him and says, I've installed my king on Zion, my holy mountain. This is also where the temple will be built and stuff like this. So this is a, a central area. Um, something kind of, um, kind of cool, kind of interesting with this is the Jebusites tell David, like when he's going to come take over this city, they're like, David, your army is so lame, and we have these walls, your army is so lame that we could basically fight you with our blind people and our lame people. Why well, use the word lame? Uh, our people who can't walk, who are, who are uh, handicapped, crippled. Okay? So they say, so David says, you know what? Because you said that, I'm going to come in there, kill all of you, and I'm going to kick out your blind and lame people. And that's what David does when he takes over the, uh, the city. Now, that's not doesn't sound very nice, but David, remember, is, is working out the, uh, the judgment of God in a unique role as king. So David gets in there, kicks out all the, uh, the blind and the lame from uh, Jabus, and uh, renames it Jerusalem. The cool thing here is in Matthew 27, before Jesus is crucified... Okay. Jesus goes into the temple, and what does he do to the, the temple and the last week before he's uh, crucified? Trashes it. Yeah, he, he drives out the money changers, overturns tables, and then says, um, this, my father's house should be a house of prayer, a temple for all the nations. So he quotes Isaiah, he quotes Jeremiah, he quotes Psalm 69, zeal for your house has consumed me. But in Matthew 27... Jesus heals, uh, it, Matthew picks up on this detail that Jesus heals, he, he probably healed a lot of people, but Matthew points out Jesus healed two types of people after he did that. Uh, guess what types of people got healed by Jesus? Blind and lame. The blind and the lame. So Jesus, kind of like David, gets rid of the blind and the lame, except this time Jesus is healing them. So they should have picked up on, Matthew is like, your king is is here, who is like David, um, but they're going to reject Jesus, obviously. Um, so that happens there. Now David wants to not only centralize the kingdom, but God said in Deuteronomy 12, when you have the place, one place that God chooses to represent the one God, to, and God chooses that place for His name to dwell, you know, you, that's where everybody should gather. And those uh, yearly like feasts that Israel is supposed to have where they're supposed to go up and sacrifice and worship. Uh, the Passover, the Day of Atonement, the, uh, the Feast of Booths, um, the Feast of, um, of Weeks. They're supposed to go up to a certain centralized place. Well, they're going to go to Jerusalem. But what does David want to relocate to Jerusalem now that it's the, the capital? How does he want to make it the capital of uh, worship as well as um, the political capital. What what item needs to be moved that we haven't heard of in a while? Yeah. The tabernacle. Um, the ark, ark. Yes, the tabernacle will be moved too, um, in, in in a way. But also, that's where David's going to say, "Well, can we be done with this tent and upgrade the tabernacle to be a permanent temple?" Um, so yeah, they're going to need to move uh, the ark to Jerusalem. This is where we start to see um, a problem. 
David is going to want something good, but he's going to go about it in a way that is sinful. And he's, he usually has a habit of inquiring of God before he does something. And so it may not be immediately obvious to us in 2 Samuel 6 um, what's, what's wrong here, but we see the result that, um, would you guys remember when it happens when David tries to move the ark? What? Well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. It, oh man. It's either I think it's either that somebody people who weren't supposed to touch it like touch it or if they like drop it or something. Uh, a little bit of both. Yeah, they they, they, they drop it um, and this guy touches it and he dies. Now, it's like, okay, why did that happen? Well, because they're transporting it in the way God uh, in a way that God has not told them to do. Okay. So they're moving it against God's instructions. They're, it's okay to move the ark, but they're putting it basically on a parade, and, God's, and David's treating God like he's this thing you can kind of move around, and, and uh, David's kind of making a lot out of himself in this act, and all these things to basically uh, bring attention in the wrong way and on the wrong things about God and kind of treating God like a, a, an idol, a good luck charm, trying to get a better signal on God, like with a cell phone. And God does not honor David and the others treating him uh, like this. He needed to be more uh, reverent and follow God's instructions. So they put the Ark of the Covenant on a new cart and they, they bring it in with a parade and celebration. This would, in a sense, be okay, the celebration, but you're not supposed to transport the ark on a cart. How are you supposed to uh, transport the ark? Yeah, Abigail. Uh, by the handles that is right on that. Handles. It has poles. It has rings on it to slip the poles through so that nobody touches it. It has poles so that people don't drop it. Um, and so you have up here the, the new art, uh, the new cart. That's not what God said. He said to transport it. He gives instructions in Exodus 28, Numbers, uh, other places of how to transport and move the ark so that people don't die. Um, and so look at <clears throat> uh, chapter 6. says, Now David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and David arose and went with the people who were with him, to Baal Judah, to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name, the very name of Yahweh of hosts, who is enthroned above the cherubim. So remember in their theology, the, the Ark does not move God, but that God has recognized this area as his throne and footstool above the Ark. This is also where atonement gets made on the Day of Atonement. Okay. Okay, moving the ark would be fine, but it says they place the ark of God on a new cart that they might bring it in from the house of Abinadab, which was on a hill, and Uzzah and Ahio, uh, the sons of Abinadab, were leading the new cart. So they built a cart for this purpose to basically put the ark on parade. Uh, it says, so they brought it, the ark of God from the house of Abinadab, which was on a hill, and Ahio was walking ahead of the ark. Meanwhile, David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with all kinds of instruments made of fir wood, with lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. But when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah reached out toward the ark of God to hold, uh, and took hold of it, for the oxen nearly upset it. And the anger of Yahweh burned against Uzzah, and God struck him down there for his irreverence, and he died there by the ark of the Lord. Okay, So somebody dies from David's negligence or from David going along with this plan of transporting the ark against God's instruction. Now it talks about Uzzah dies because of his irreverence. He's not supposed to touch the ark. They're not supposed to transport the ark like this. But the ark and God's holiness is not the problem. Sin and following God's instructions are not the problem. David didn't inquire of the Lord. He didn't treat God as holy. So David's afraid, and I'll read in a second, and he says, how can I ever have the ark come into Jerusalem? And it's not the movement of the ark. It's just doing it right. Now, 
a lot of people are like, well, why did, that seems a little harsh that this guy just trying to help out died. But having an appreciation of doing things God's way and the holiness of God, um, this guy was afraid that the ark was going to fall onto the ground. Right? And I understand that. I understand why he did what he did. But what is the moral significance of, of dirt or mud or water, whatever the ark was going to fall onto? What is, you know, is, is dirt, um, is it or can it be sinful? It doesn't have a sin nature. Dirt doesn't commit sin. But what about humans? Humans are sinners. And so Jonathan Edwards has this quote on this section where he says, the mistake, the sin of Uzzah was irreverence, and it was thinking that, that he was cleaner than the ground that the ark was going to fall onto. The ground is not a, a sinner, but Uzzah is. And he's, he's reaching out to touch something that he's treating God as common. And so he reaches out to touch the ark and he dies. And so look at verse 8 where David is frustrated. It says, David became angry because of Yahweh's outburst against Uzzah. And, place, uh, and the place became known as Perez Uzzah to this day, uh, which means the breakthrough of Uzzah, where God broke out against him. So David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how can the ark of the Lord come to me? Meaning, I'm a sinner too. I can't bring in, this is danger, too dangerous to move the ark. I thought this is what God wanted, but maybe it isn't. <clears throat> it says, and David was unwilling to move the ark uh, of the Lord into the city of David with him, but David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom. So they put the ark in this guy's house, and he and his family start getting blessed in all these other ways. And so David picks up on the fact that says, okay, the ark is not the problem. The ark can bring blessing as well as death and destruction. It's how we treat God. So now David does it the right way. Look at verse 12. It says, now it was told King David saying, Yahweh has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him on account of the ark of God. David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with gladness. And it was so that when the bearers of the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. And David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, and David was wearing a linen ephod. Uh, so David and all the house of Israel were uh, bringing up the ark of the Lord with the shouting and the sound of the trumpet. Okay, so David now does it the right way. Now a couple of things to note from this. Um, David is humbled and is following the instructions on how to transport the ark. And they're excited because now the ark is going to be centralized in Jerusalem. God is moving forward redemptive history. Eventually, you know, a temple uh, will be built uh, there as well. This will, will move forward God's plan even more. Okay. But why, uh, what does David do after they walk a couple of steps in verse uh, 13? So after they go a few steps, what does David do? Six thirteen. Yeah. He sacrificed. Mm -hmm. Sacrifices an ox and a fatling. Okay. Now, also look at verse fourteen. What is David wearing? Because he's not wearing his kingly outfit. He's wearing something else. The linen ephod. Yeah. Okay. So who usually makes sacrifices? Not in what role? Not usually the, huh? The priest. the priest. Yep. So the priests are the ones who make sacrifices. Now here's kind of the, um, well, let me talk about the other thing. Who wears the linen ephod? Not the kings, but who? The priests. The priests. Uh, Exodus uh, 28 talks about the, the 
priest's outfit, what they're supposed to wear. So David strips off his kingly outfit to wear the outfit of the priest. Okay? And his wife is so like embarrassed that he's dressed down like this that he's like, you're basically naked. Um, and so I've seen people take this, you know, this passage. Um, have any of you guys seen the movie Footloose? Mm -hmm. No? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah? Okay. This passage, yeah, David danced before the Lord. That's why we got to have a dance at our school. It's like, that's not what it's talking about. <laughs> but also, I've seen people take this passage and be like, yeah, David danced naked in his worship, like, because his wife said, well, you're basically naked. He's not naked. He's wearing a linen ephod that covers the body. But it was basically, yeah, people will find weird things to try to justify their, their, their thoughts from the Bible. Like, well, if David dances naked, then, you know, like, yeah, it's, uh, this is why I don't interact with Facebook I mean, comments anymore. What's that? Yeah. Well, that's what people say. I'm like, I'm not even joking. That's, I've seen people say this. Um, but so he's wearing a linen ephod. He's wearing the outfit and doing the act of what role? The priest. The priest. So it's like his wife's upset because you're not acting like a king. You're acting like a priest. Here's the the problem. David, can the kings be priests? No. No. They're not allowed to do the job. They're not allowed to be a Levitical priest. Their kings are from Judah. Priests are from Levi. And they're not allowed to usurp the role of the Levitical priests. They're not allowed to go into the Holy of Holies. They're not allowed to go. Um, Saul does the sacrifice that Samuel's supposed to do early, all these things. Okay? But David is, in a right way, kind of acting like a priest. So David actually later will start to reflect on this. And he, he writes Psalm 110. And he thinks about, you know what? In order to do my job really well as king, Ultimately, I'm going to have to, or, or somebody in my line is going to have to really fulfill some role as a priest. Not the Levitical priests of the Mosaic system, but the king has to act like a priest in some way. And so he reflects on this, and he thinks back to Genesis 14, and he remembers there is a king and a priest to God who comes to Abraham in Genesis 14 named Melchizedek, who was the king of early Jerusalem, the king of Salem. And so David thinks through this and says in Psalm 110, Psalm 110 is the psalm where David says, Yahweh says to my Lord, uh, hang on just a second, Yahweh says to my Lord, this is the Messiah, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet, and then talks about the Messiah rule in the midst of your enemies. Um, and talks about God stretching forth his kingdom from Zion, and then it says, uh, then this is what God says to the, the Messiah, the Davidic king. It says to the Messiah in Psalm 110.4, You are a priest forever, not like the Levitical priesthood, but he says you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You are a king priest. So the Messiah will be a priest, but he's not going to go into the tabernacle. He's not going into the temple. He's going to accomplish uh, the role of a priest for God in a different, um, in a different way. Um, Abigail, did you have a question, comment? Oh, I was just wondering if I could. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so Hebrews picks up on this. Actually, Isaiah 52 and 53 pick up on this too. That in what way is the Messiah, the king, going to be a priest? Because so we talk about Jesus as our great high priest. What does he do as a priest? Um, yeah. He makes the ultimate sacrifice. Makes the ultimate sacrifice. Yep, not of uh, bulls and goats and, and other things, but he sacrifices himself once for all, and, and that brings the old sacrificial system to uh, a close. And then also, what, uh, what does the, the king, uh, what does Jesus do as a priest? Forgives us our sins. Who's the priest supposed to represent um, before God? Oh, the mediator? Yeah, he's a mediator. He's going to uh, intercede for us before God, right? And then also um, to show that his work is complete, um, where, where is Jesus located right now? And I, I'm not right meaning hand right hand of God. Yep, that his work is complete, that after he rose from the dead, he went and sat down. And the author of Hebrews says... Um, in the Old Testament system, when the priests offered sacrifices, 
Did they sit down in the Holy of Holies and stay there? Yes or no? Mm -hmm. No. They're not allowed to stay. You go in every year, you keep making sacrifices, but you have to leave. Um, Jesus, when he goes into heaven, sits down. And that's what Hebrews says, is that he completes his role as a priest. Um, and is still in heaven there to show that the work is complete, but also he intercedes uh, on our behalf before God. Okay, so David starts to think through, okay, my role is going to include a priestly role, but not the, the Levitical priesthood. It needs to be a, a different one that's appropriate for the king. Okay, so David moves um, the ark. Now God it blesses David and worship is centralized here in Jerusalem. Okay, and David builds a palace for himself and is experiencing peace and rest and all these things are going on uh, that are great. But David starts to feel a little bit funny or weird about something. Okay, God's giving him all this blessing and David wants now to do something for God because he feels kind of like out of place. What, what does David want to do? Why does he start to feel kind of weird, like something's just not quite right? So think about that they have the capital Jerusalem, the ark is now there, David has a huge palace, now what does David want to do? What's the next big step once the tavern, once the uh, tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant are there? It's around the board too. Sacrifice. No, it'll have to do with that, but yeah. David wants to build God a temple in the house. Yes, he wants to build God a temple. He starts to feel funny about the fact that he has a huge house. And he says, well, it doesn't seem to match that I have a huge palace, but I need, you know, God doesn't have a house. God's still camping in a tent is what, you know, it looks like, right? So, yeah. Can I go to the back? Yeah. And so he wants to build David a house. What's the house of, of God uh, called? I mean, what type of, uh, what is this? You have a house for God. What does that refer to? Temple. Yeah. So he wants to build God a temple, he says, but he wants to build God a house. Yeah. Can I go up to my nose? Yeah, that's fine. Um, but God says to David, no, he's not going to allow him to build a temple at, uh, at this time. Okay. So, uh, but God makes a play on words. He says to David, David, you're not going to give me a house first. Actually, I'm going to give you what? A house. A house. Okay, but in this sense, house is being used in two different ways. God, uh, David's talking about God, building God a physical building house called a temple. But what does it mean when you talk about the house of like a king? It's like a dynasty. Dynasty or family line, yeah. So if we talk about like Queen Elizabeth, who just died a few uh, months ago, um, she, she and her family are called the House of Windsor. It's this family line that's held the throne for a certain period of time. Now we're going to have the House of David. God says, look, David, I know you want to build me a house, and that's great. And he's going to let David's son, Solomon, build him the house. But he says, actually, I need to establish something more important, more fundamental with you first, and that is the Davidic covenant. He says, David, I need to give you a house before you or anyone in your family gives me a house. And this is, um, and I wrote down the elements of this covenant. I think I have about 11 of them here. This is, I don't think I need to hesitate to say this is the most important covenant in the Bible. And why I say that is because all of the other covenants basically plug into this one. And it, all the other covenants stand or fall. If this one is fulfilled, all the other covenants are fulfilled. If this one is not fulfilled, all the other covenants are not fulfilled and fail as well. And as I was thinking about it this morning, it's good we're kind of in a computer lab here, but we have like this power strip under here, you know, for this, for the computer. Like there's a few things like plugged in here, okay? 
That's fine as long as the power strip is plugged in and turned on. Mm -hmm. However, if it gets turned off, what happens to all the computers? Or is not plugged in or is not working? Build up. Build up. Yeah, you guys may have seen this. If you use these for like Christmas lights, you plug all the Christmas lights into one thing. If the power strip doesn't work, all the Christmas lights are, are off, right? That's kind of how the Davidic covenant is. Everything else, every other covenant God makes to depend on this one. So if the king obeys God and is in right relationship with him, it has great potential that we'll see for working out God's kingdom and promises on the earth. If the king does not obey God, the promises don't go away, but the king experiences God's discipline. Okay? It basically says that God says to David, I'm going to treat your sons like sons to me, and when they sin, I'm going to spank them. That's what he says. He says that I'll discipline them with the strokes of men and with the rods of men. Okay? Um, but here's uh, the promises, and we'll get more into this next uh, semester, but we'll finish up uh, talking about some of these promises in the Davidic covenant. So in verse, verses 8 and 9, David is promised that God says, I will give you a great name. I will make you a great name. What does that sound like? What other covenant it says this? Abrahamic. Abrahamic. Now, David is kind of like new Abraham, picking up the promises of Abraham. So now the Davidic covenant, uh, the Abrahamic covenant, is going to be fulfilled through the Davidic covenant being fulfilled. Okay? He also says, I will give your people, or God says, I will give my people a land and a place to dwell in, and they will not be uprooted again. Um, which covenant promises Israel uh, land? Or I should say covenants. Which, which covenant promises land? Yeah. Mosaic. Uh, Mosaic, yep. They'll be planted in the land and not uprooted if they obey God. What other covenant promises land? Land, seed, blessing. Mosaic. Uh, we got Mosaic. Abrahamic. Abrahamic. Yep. They all tie together now. And then he says, I will give um, you rest from your enemies. You will have peace, rest in the land. Right? Well, rest goes all the way back to Genesis 1 and 2, God's creational blessing uh, of fellowship with God, peace, rest through the earth, a state of rest. And then yeah. I guess I was thinking of Noah. You, yeah, no, that's right. Um, he also fulfills the Noahic covenant because God promised rest in the Noahic covenant. So that one plugs in as well. That ultimately, if you have the right king, the king can provide rest for Israel and then rest for the world, going back to what it was like in the Garden of Eden. Okay? So this is what uh, Hebrews picks up on. So Joshua doesn't give them full rest. The judges don't give them full rest. If you have the right king, the right king can provide uh, rest. Um, but a lot of times you don't have the right king. You'll have Solomon, who it says during his reign in, in 1 Kings 4.25, that everybody rested, everybody under his vine and fig tree. There's this peace. But then Solomon's kingdom starts to fall apart because of his sin. Okay, so rest. And then the new covenant. Remember, Jesus comes and promises you know, that... Uh, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, uh, Matthew 11, 27 and 28. So even the new covenant is tied into the, the Davidic covenant. Um, so the reason why we even have salvation in Jesus personally, and the new covenant of having a new heart and forgiveness of sins, it's because Jesus as king fulfilled the Davidic covenant. He's able to be the king who brings the true uh, true rest. Um, he also is promised a house and a dynasty, that there will be this continual line of David that will always be uh, the ones that are on the throne. He's promised uh, seed, okay? Where does that, so he's going to have descendants who are going to take the throne, but where does the word seed, what does that remind us of? Abraham? Abraham, yep. Seed promise of Abraham, but See, promise of Abraham goes back even earlier. It picks up uh, what promise? Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Yep, the seed of the woman, right? <laughs> so the seed of the woman will come through. Um, yeah, that's all right. Will come through uh, Abraham and will come through David. Okay. 
You guys remember Matthew 1.1 talks about, this is the book of the generations of Jesus, the Messiah, son of Abraham, son of David. That's what uh, Abraham is proving. Okay? Um, verse 12 promises him a kingdom, that there, David is going to have a Davidic kingdom kingdom that's going to rule over Israel, and eventually, with the right king, will rule over the whole earth. Kind of cool thing about this um, is the fact that with Jesus coming and being the right king, 2,000 years even after Jesus has uh, come and is the right king, we as Gentiles are nations that have turned to the God of Israel through Jesus as king. And we're subjects of Jesus as king. We're under his kingdom. So Jesus' kingdom is seen all over the earth for right? every uh, believer. And then he's going to actually come and, uh, and reign. Um, so it's a bigger thing than just us being saved. It's that we're saved and we're part of a worldwide kingdom um, in Jesus that's going to be fulfilled when he comes. Um, and the interesting thing is in Micah, the prophet later on, hundreds of years after David, that he's going to say, it's going to sound like God has abandoned these promises because Micah's going to say, God says you're done with these promises right now, but he says you're not totally done uh, because God is going to, you're not going to have a king until God sends the true king, sends the Messiah. Um, the kings will be temple builders. Solomon will build the temple. Jesus, when he comes, the Messiah will build the temple. He talks about this in Zechariah talks about this in Ezekiel 40 through 48. The Messiah will build God's true uh, temple. And the church right now is a representation of God's temple. Um, he'll be given an eternal throne. He will be treated as God's son. He will be disciplined when he sins, or he will suffer for sin. It doesn't mean he has to be disciplined for his own sin. He can be disciplined for other sin. And then God promises a, co a covenant or loyal love to the house of David forever. Uh, and just as we finish up here, just to the, with hopefully greater appreciation of this verse, I'll read us a, a Christmas verse that has to do with the Messiah. But now understanding how important and foundational this role of, of the Davidic covenant is and David as king, listen to how the Messiah gets described in a verse that usually comes out on like Christmas cards. Um, Isaiah 9, 6 says, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given, and the government will rest on his shoulders. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government, uh, and uh, his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish... Uh, uh, to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. And so, so Jesus is the king who rules for God on David's throne, and his rule is going to be uh, worldwide. And some evidence about that is, right now, uh, there are people all over the world, 2,000 years later, uh, who worship Jesus. Right, So that, that's a hint that uh, Jesus' kingdom is going to uh, reign and rule on the earth when he comes. Okay, um, so we're going to quit there.